Wisconsinites in Maple Bluff at the governor's residence, talking to Governor Scott Walker about the 2014 about to end and 2015. Governor, thanks for welcome back to Wisconsin Eye. Great to be with you. If you had to describe 2014 in one one word, what what word would you pick? Exciting. Exciting. Yeah, it was an exciting year, certainly with the elections, but with the good news, even we've seen the last month or so in terms of the economy, unemployment's down to 5.2 percent. I mean, think about it. Back at the beginning of 2010, it was 9.2 percent. So. We're excited about where the economy is headed. We're excited about taking on a new term. We're excited about winning a third election in four years. We're excited just about the state as a whole. Um, you're deep into budget work on mm -hmm. the 2015-2017 budget. Yeah. The, the deficit estimates range from, as you know, 2.2 .2 to 824, yeah. the last fiscal bureau memo. Now that you've seen some numbers, what is the uh, potential Closer deficit? to the 800, but it, really what it is, it's driven, as you know, following these numbers for years, by over $700 million in Medicaid. Just the cost to continue, that's without any changes. 760. Uh, yeah, you're talking over $700 million just to keep Medicaid as it is today. And in an area that's frustrated not only me, but governors all across this country, uh, because the federal government doesn't give us a lump sum, they give us the money with strings attached, uh, we can make very few changes to that without dropping off big chunks of people from Medicaid. We don't want to do that. Uh, obviously, long term, we'd love to have a, a block grant, uh, I think, in all of the 50 states so that we could make reasonable adjustments, do things like co-pays and things like that. But there's relatively little we can do there. Uh, like I said, we're not going to cut people off in mass. We just put a whole new wave of people living in poverty on, mm -hmm. transition people living above it into the marketplace. And so we're going to have to make reductions elsewhere. But th the rest of it, the, the higher number that sometimes gets banded around, is really driven by if every agency requests, both those in my administration and those outside of the administration, got exactly what their wish list was, it would be much higher. But the reality is obviously they're not going to get You that. don't have any choice but to fund that 760. In Pretty much. Mm -hmm. You can make a few right? tweaks, but there's not much room for... Uh, You're going to be able to increase or recommend an increase in uh, reimbursement rates, sir? Well, I think we're going to be locked into where we're at. I mean, short of more money from the federal government. I mean, just this last week, we saw nationally stories about health care providers, doctors and others, complaining that they were enticed to come into Obamacare, and now the Medicaid reimbursement rates are being backed away from because the federal government's not making their commitment. I mean, a year ago we talked about this, two years ago I talked about it, when people were criticizing me for not taking the Medicaid expansion, but this is exactly the scenario I talked about that people get pulled in, whether it's a state being pulled in with the expansion or it's health care providers with promises of higher reimbursement rates. In each of these cases, we're seeing the reality is what I predicted, which is the federal government's not making their commitments. Governors in states like Tennessee are trying to qualify for more MA aid with unique plans that mm -hmm. don't involve setting up a, uh, th their own marketplace. Um, will your budget uh, do that, ask for a federal waiver to attract additional MA federal cash without setting up a marketplace, sir? Well, we're looking at all sorts of different options out here. What we did a year and a half, almost two years ago now, was very much driven by not taking the false choice of, of Washington. We didn't take the expansion, but we didn't go down the route of some states that didn't, uh, that, uh, that ultimately left the whole wave of people uncovered. We did something unique, kind of the Wisconsin way, and we found a way to cover everyone for the first time living in poverty. People forget there had been a wait list for people uh, seeking uh, assistance under Medicaid, living in poverty. So people, poverty level or below under Governor Jim Doyle, we wiped that list out for the first time in our state's history. Everyone is covered. In fact, it's why the, uh, one of the renowned uh, nonprofit foundations pointed out that we're actually the only state in the country that didn't take an expansion that has no insurance gap, meaning we're covered. Uh, people have access to health care one way or the other. And then we're going to look for unique ways to, to build off of that in the future. Stay with health care. Um, if the U.S. Supreme Court rules that the affordable mm -hmm. care subsidies incentives are not allowed in states like Wisconsin, mm -hmm. which did not set up its own exchange, how will you respond as governor, sir? Well, I think in that case, you got, with a new United States Senate majority, you're probably going to have a, an immediate proposal by the Congress uh, to provide an alternative to that. Because one, you've had, just as you know, the court decisions, you've had a higher court rule both ways, yes. almost within moments of each other. And so it's a big question mark as to what the Supreme Court might do if they take that up and act on it, what way they would go one way or the other, or if, or if they even act on it at all. Um, but I think if they do, it's pretty clear that with this new Senate majority and with the House, uh, many of them would like to repeal Obamacare outright Obviously, with this president in the next two years, that's not going to happen. But if something like that were to happen in front of the Supreme Court, my belief is they'd give some time frame uh, for a transition. And I believe the Congress would act to provide an alternative for the states. 
Do you think Congress should act and not uh, each each state? And the reason I ask is I ask uh, the Wisconsin Hospital Association mm -hmm. about this scenario yeah. if the Supreme Court ruling went the other way. And they said it would create a, quote, urgent problem, end of quote, in Wisconsin. Well, it would create an urgent problem across the country. So not just Wisconsin, anywhere out, out there. But it goes to the heart of what's wrong with Obamacare. Again, with this president, I don't think, even though I think many of us logically would say that should be kind of one of the final pushes to repeal Obamacare and replace it with something else, my hope would be a more patient-centered plan that would put the patients back in charge, not go back to the old system of bureaucracy that was at the private sector level, which was replaced by a government-driven bureaucracy. Ideally, I think having patients be the ones back in charge, have a market-driven system that gets people to have skin in the game again. I'd love to have an outright repeal that is replaced with something like that. I don't see that happening with this president, but I do think there could be something in between that would provide relief, not only for Wisconsin, but for states across the country. Do you hope the U.S. Supreme Court um, rules and forces Congress to ask? Act, excuse me? Uh, we haven't engaged in that. You know, we were we had an opportunity to be involved in that lawsuit. We did not do that just because for us there's a lot of uncertainty. You remember last year about this time we had delayed uh, the transition that we had to move people from government dependence mm -hmm. uh, into the marketplace for those living above poverty because I always thought Medicaid was for people living in poverty, um, and so we made that transition. But we delayed it by three months because the federal government had failed to put in place their plans. In the, in the budget, the past budget I had two years ago, the timing was set by law to say if the uh, Affordable Care Act is delayed, if the exchanges as part of Obamacare are delayed, so would our transition. As you know, by law, uh, the act was not delayed, but by practice, uh, people couldn't get in the fall preceding uh, the beginning of that program. And so we said, we're not going to let people fall through the cracks. The same thing holds true here. I think Obamacare is bad for this country. I think it's a bad law. I think it causes immense damage to the people of the state of Wisconsin because we were a state where over 90% of our citizens had coverage already, unlike other states around the country, where we're kind of we're taking the, the grief for the inaction they've had in the past. We needed to make some tweaks, mainly to try and drive down the cost of health care for people, particularly those working at small businesses. That has not done that. In fact, for many of our small businesses, it dramatically increased premiums. So I'd love to get back to a, a, an opportunity where the states and, more importantly, individual patients and, and small business owners and others could make those decisions. But in the meantime, I'm not going to do things halfway that put our people at risk. Um, let's go back to the budget. Ha having made a first pass, you're well aware of the, the big drivers, school aids, mm -hmm and uh, transportation, tax credits that control property mm -hmm. taxes, shared revenue, um, and health care as we discussed. Mm -hmm. Is there going to be room for another uh, tax cut, sir? I don't think you'll see one in income tax right off the bat in this budget. I mean, long term, we'd like to lay out a plan where we'd like to be the next four, six, eight, ten years down the road and, and set out a strategy for how to get there. Uh, but I think for the next two years, property taxes is really paramount for us. Uh, mainly because that's the tax we hear the most about. We hear about it from working families. We hear about it from senior citizens and fixed incomes for sure. We hear about it from small business owners and family farmers and others out there. I think a, a large-scale income tax cut like we proposed in the past would be difficult to get through in light of all those other concerns. But it's going to be a little bit of, of different things. It's going to be uh, some adjustments to how state agencies are run. Certainly big state agencies like Corrections and one of our big partners, the University of Wisconsin, a system, I think we're looking at potentially some major changes there. And then it's, uh, you know, entitlement reforms, uh, education reforms, other things that help us put the power back in the hands of local taxpayers. Is Secretary Gottlieb going to get that $550 million in from the general fund that, that he's requested, sir? Well, we're, we're certainly looking at all the options. We think there's a tremendous need for transportation in this state, not only tied into the people who build and maintain and design our transportation infrastructure, but in the larger context, for all the industries, uh, the, the economic thrust that depends on it. You look at manufacturing, agriculture, tourism, the timber industry, a lot of those industries are heavily dependent on a strong transportation infrastructure system, be it our roads and our bridges, but also our ports, our airports, our freight rail. All those are interconnected to our, to our state's economy and our growth there. Um, I think, though, if we're going to make, whether it's taking funds that had previously been in the general fund, transferring into the transportation fund, or looking at other revenue streams, what we're going to be doing in the next few weeks is continue to look very closely at the dollar amount that the Department of Transportation is asking for, and first off, making sure that uh, we think that's valid for the next two years, and along with that, 
uh, looking at uh, what are the reasonable ways uh, that we can get that work done in a way that doesn't add a tremendous tax burden on the citizens of this state. Should there be a surtax which amounts to a sales tax surtax if you buy a new vehicle, sir? And what about the idea if you drive a hybrid or a electric car? Should you pay more in registration fees? Well, you know, we look at all those options. I mean, we asked Secretary Gottlieb, without regard to what our final product was going to be, we said, give us what you think is best. That's what we've asked of other state agencies. We didn't say, give us what you think is politically acceptable. Give us what you think is best, and then we'll try and decipher not only the amount, but, but also the different ways of putting that together. You know, clearly, I have concerns, as I think many lawmakers do, about a gas tax increase. I think there's some real legitimate concerns about things that in any way would hamper the ability for automobile and, and uh, truck dealers to sell vehicles, anything that would add a deterrent there, because a lot of the revenue that both the state and local counties receive comes in the form of the sales tax. Much of that is generated by automobile-related purchases, be they new or used out there. If you do things that dramatically uh, have an impact on that, you're going to have an impact on revenue streams at both the state and the county level. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think you know, you'd be mindful of all these different changes. But again, it's a balancing act. We've got true transportation needs out there to fuel the economy. We've got legitimate needs in terms of the impact on individual taxpayers and what it does in purchases uh, of large-scale items like an automobile. And we've got to make sure we balance all those items. Uh, I know how important Christian faith is to you. You have said in terms of the presidency you have to feel called. Mm -hmm. Do you feel called to run for the presidency? I'm trying to decipher that. I mean, honestly, uh, it's one of those where I, I felt I was called to be governor. I think over the last four years with all the, the turmoil we went through, I'm glad that I felt it was a calling because I don't know that I would have wanted to aspire to that knowing what I was facing over the last four years, but I think it was worth it. And I was glad I had that to lean on. But, you know, the closer I've gotten, the more I've realized, I've, I've said this only half jokingly, that anyone who gets this close and really knows what it means to, to be in that office, who wants to be that purely for, for the title, has got to be a little bit crazy. Uh, the only way one should actually consider that is if you honestly feel called to, and that's something I'm still trying to decide. Two follow-up questions on that. Do you want to have a decision on run for the presidency by uh, uh, the middle of next year, sir? Do you have a timeline? Well, I think you can't go too far into 2015, no matter who it is, me or any other prospective candidate, without having made a decision by then. And I'm always intrigued. Um, the Charles Franklin polls show mm -hmm. that a majority of Wisconsin residents advise you to not run yeah. for president. Do you think you'd pay a price back home if you did run, sir? Why, well, why, I mean, why are you getting advice from those who answer Mr. Franklin's polls not to run? Actually, the, you know, the, I remember years ago when I served in the state assembly, uh, sometimes candidates who were successful mayors uh, sometimes had a difficult time getting elected to the legislature. Uh, people always thought that was odd, but in a way it was almost a compliment because they said they didn't want to lose their mayor. Um, and uh, so I think often it's a mixed blessing that if people like the job you're doing, whether it's a county executive, governor, uh, mayor, whatever the position might be, sometimes people don't want to lose you from that position. So it's not a matter of not liking you running for that office, but rather not wanting you to leave. Um, any decision I make is going to be made, you know, obviously first and foremost based upon the impact on me and my family. But in the larger context, I've got to make decisions based upon what I think is good um, and the right thing to do. I mean, I made a decision back in 2009 to get in the race for governor after Tonette and I sat down and talked about for a long time, thought about, ultimately prayed about getting in the race uh, for governor. The reason we did was because I was afraid back then that my sons, Matt and Alex, who today are 19 and 20, but back then were in high school, were growing up in a state that wasn't as great as the one I grew up in. And that just, as a parent, was unacceptable, and I decided to do something about it. We knew our eyes were wide open. We knew running for statewide office would be difficult and challenging and sometimes downright just nasty to go through as a family. But we knew it was worth it because we thought we were called to do something better, not just for Matt and Alex, but for all the other sons and daughters like them. To me, going ahead, um, you know, I, I don't make decisions. If I did, clearly, in the last four years, there's a lot of things I would have done differently. I don't make decisions based on polls or based on uh, whether people are going to like or dislike me. I make them on, based on what I think is the right thing to do. And uh, I remember about four years ago at this time, I told my cabinet, some lawmakers, I said, I'm going to make decisions like I don't care about getting elected in the next term. I'm going to do what I think is the right thing to do. Uh, ultimately, I challenge the legislature uh, in something that I think was carried on and then said we need to think more about the next generation than just about the next election. And so any decision I make in the future will be held to that same standard. As a former Milwaukee County Executive mm -hmm. and you also represented the metro area in the mm -hmm. Assembly, 
you may have a knowledge of the city of Milwaukee issues mm -hmm. that other governors haven't. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of those issues. Guns, problems, guns, gangs, joblessness, joblessness drugs, dropout rates that in 2013 were 58% for African Americans, 56% for Hispanics. What will you do or recommend in the second term to help the city of Milwaukee deal with those problems, sir? Yeah, well, first, you're right. It's heart-wrenching. Both my sons were born at St. Joseph Hospital in the heart of the city of Milwaukee. Uh, my home is literally a block away from the city of Milwaukee. Uh, my parents for many years lived in Milwaukee as well. And so um, I have a heart for that issue, having represented the area, certainly all of Milwaukee when I was kind of executive. Uh, there's a variety of things. I mean, on, on one end, um, you know, our Transform Milwaukee program, we're going to continue to focus on trans transitional jobs as part of Transform Milwaukee, uh, which is part of the reason why we built the new headquarters for the Department of Children and Families on the heart of the west side of downtown Milwaukee. It's why we made investments, uh, in whether it's the water center or a number of things we've done at the University of Wisconsin, where we've uh, the School of Public Medicine or Public Health is at the north side uh, of downtown Milwaukee and near the heart of the city as well. All those are about making investments to try and improve the economic plight uh, that we see there. That there's a tremendous backbone in terms of transportation, there's a tremendous backbone in terms of commerce. Unfortunately, it's not affecting uh, many neighborhoods within the city of Milwaukee. We need to be more aggressive in terms of helping people get those transitional jobs, get back into the workplace, get back going again, and as you help really transform uh, those neighborhoods, you're going to help have a ripple effect. Secondly, uh, certainly from a public safety standpoint, it's part of the reason why last year after visiting with Chief Flynn, we invested money to help match the state, the city, and the county together. Uh, threefold came together and funded the, the uh, Shot Spotter program. Um, we're going to look at ways that we can continue to help with projects like that in the future. One of the most amazing things I found in that Shot Spotter uh, demonstration was given to me is that when they first came in and looked at this geographical area on the north side of Milwaukee, they found, and it's a system they, they've u literally used from the Department of Defense, it's used overseas in, in, in uh, war settings, they brought that in and used it in these neighborhoods and they were able to pinpoint within seconds a firearm going off. Mm -hmm. Not only was that technology amazing, but what was shocking to me is in the sample they showed me, they, they were able to initially test and find that just 14% of, of the time were calls made after a shot was fired within those neighborhoods. So that means almost all the rest of the time, people were ignoring it. Either they just had grown immune to shots being fired, which is a horrible thing to think about, or they in many cases were afraid uh, to call the police for fear of retaliation from others in those areas. The good news with this technology is without those calls, it still allows within minutes police response there and hopefully trying to capture the people who are causing that kind of havoc on, on increasingly, sadly, in the last few weeks, not just individual residents, but children uh, when gunshots are fired. So we need to get those people off the streets, things, technology like shot spotter. The third big thing is education. Uh, not only in MPS and K-12, it's why I supported uh, opening up and expanding school choice to say that for low-income families and now for middle-class families locked in schools that were failing, we give them a more viable alternative. We also put in place through Act 10 and other reforms new provisions to allow NPS to have all their schools act more like successful charter schools. We're going to do more of that in the future. It's why we invested in MATC, the Milwaukee Area Technical College, and other work-related programs because ultimately if we're going to get people back up on their feet again, We've got to get them the skills and the education they need to succeed. Um, uh, I just have a couple more questions. I, 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 I want to respect your time. Should there be age limits on Supreme Court justices, sir? That's when I, other than reading about it, haven't spent a moment thinking about it one way or the other. Okay. You've been called the most polarizing governor. Do you think you are? No. Oh, okay. I think there are people who dislike the fact that I'm willing to do the things I said I would do who've tried to polarize things, but I think if people, anyone who's worked with me over the years has seen that, uh, in fact, even back to my days in the assembly, I used to tell new members, that don't personalize your differences because your opponent today may be your ally tomorrow. And there's been plenty of examples, even with some of the leaders of the op opposition party in the state assembly and state senate, where we've been more than able to work with people. I don't think I'm polarizing in any regard in that. I just think there are some people who don't like leaders who follow through with the things that they said they're gonna do. And, that's upset some people, including many people from outside of the state, who almost four years ago brought tens of thousands of people into the state to protest, who brought thousands of people and millions of dollars into the state to try and take me out in a recall, and who made me the number one target in the country. 
uh, just a few months ago in the in the 2014 election. But I think those are people who who want to to to, uh, to, to focus on that uh, uh, because they don't like people who actually follow through and are effective in doing what they say they were going to do. At the start of the interview, I asked you to summarize one word for 2014. Give me a word to summarize 2015. <laughs> Um, action. action. I think you're going to see a lot of action in, in, uh, in 2015 from education reform, tax reform, entitlement reform. Uh, you're going to see it in 2015. We got a new legislature. Somebody pointed out to me, I think statistically about 70 percent uh, of the assembly uh, after the swearing in this next week will actually have not been in office before I was governor. So there's a lot That's of people right. who are ready to get to action. Right. Uh, Governor Scott Walker, thanks for talking to Wisconsin Eye. Happy Thank New you. Year to you and your family. Saved you. Thank you.